Security and Energy webinar series. This webinar is being recorded. Your host, Eric Mucklow, is not with us today, so I will be subbing. But don't worry, he'll be back in two weeks. To access these webinars, they, you can go to the Mercy website listed here. Um, also, these webinars will give AIA credit in groups of five presentations. Also, the, web, uh, the website is listed here. For any questions, please email Lindsay Pruitt. I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Janicek. She's a senior mechanical engineer from Erdic Searle. She conducts research on energy wa and water and related sustainability issues as they impact U.S. Army installations. She is the water team lead for the project integrating installation energy water and waste we uh, modeling, which is developing decision scale planning tools for integrating energy, water, and waste. Ongoing projects include Army installation water sustainability assessments. There are eight underway and 19 completed. And demonstrations of building level cascade of water use technologies and training area water conservation. She developed the Sustainable Installation Regional Resource Assessment web-based tool and the Water Management Toolbox website. Elizabeth, you can take it from here. Thanks, Justine, and thanks for providing the opportunity to talk about this project. We're in the second year of providing water conservation support for Fort Leonard Wood. Uh, it's part of their overall installation strategic sustainability planning efforts. And the outline of my talk today, I'm going to cover a little bit of water background because you can't talk about water without identifying what the problems are. And it was also the motivation for Fort Leonard Wood for including water in their planning. Talk about the objectives in the Fort Leonard Wood work and a little overview of the water laws, policy, and code and how they affect Army installations. Then I'll go through the planning process, how we began establishing a Fort Leonard Wood baseline, what took place during our water site assessment, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about an RDT&E project that uh, Justine mentioned where we're integrating energy, water, and waste planning tools. Uh, so let me go ahead and get to it. So the next series of slides are going to talk about issues that s affect supply and demand of water on Army installations throughout the U.S. and really throughout the world. And I got a couple illustrations here that kind of tell the story. On the bottom right, we can see water use in the U.S. as broken out by sector. And this comes from a USGS report of water use that comes out every five years in the U.S. And where we see that peak in the middle in the 70s, that peak was caused by a coincidence of high agricultural withdrawals and high energy withdrawals. And after that, we got a little more efficient in both of those sectors. But what we're seeing now is water use is starting to increase again just based on the per capita water use because population is growing and people use water. We also anticipate greater increases due to energy because some of the construction of new energy thermoelectric plants has been curtailed a bit with the uh, recession. But as we move out of the recession, those plans are going back up on the table for building new plants, and each plant is going to need a source of cooling water. The other thing we see is we see a shift not just in the Army, but in the U.S. as a whole to the south, the southeast, and to the west. And these are areas that, if not downright drought prone in the southeast, they're subject to drought flood cycles. So the population is moving where water either isn't present or is unreliable. So we're seeing not unexpected conflicts. Another issue is the condition of our infrastructure. Uh, the U.S. water infrastructure itself has a backlog of maintenance and repair and expansion of over $1 trillion. And the American Society of Civil Engineers rates our water and wastewater infrastructure a D minus. And that kind of brings me into the next slide, which is this uh, handy title, Unaccounted for Water, which is another way of saying we don't know where it's going. It could be leaks. It could be other sources of loss. And what you see here in the graph 
is this is uh, a compilation of the eight net zero water installations that were designated a few years ago and it shows the end use of water and the uses that I have circled are loss and unknown and loss refers to what they could quantify as actual leaks whereas unknown well we're not really sure where it's going um, and those in all of the cases of the installation these exceeded 20 percent that's 20 percent of water that's either lost in leaks or we don't know where it's going uh, coincidentally the American Water Works Association gives a target of 15 percent for unaccounted for water so we're allowed to lose 15 but the Army right now just based on the top eight installations that are working towards net zero water are losing over 20 percent. And so part of this project I'm going to talk about both water and energy. And so we talk about the energy that's used in water and the water that's used in energy. And here we can say that quite a bit of the water that's withdrawn from our sources in the U.S. is used for energy. And though the majority of that is for thermoelectric cooling and just a fraction of that is consumptive use, without that water as a source, we could not generate electricity. And the other thing we have to be aware of is that when we specify renewable energy, we have to look at the water footprint of that because there are aspects of renewable energy that are more water intensive and there are types that are less water intensive. So it's really important that we have our energy engineers looking at water and our water planners looking at energy. Which brings me to the next slide. So this is the energy that's embedded in water. The good news about this slide is that the top two bars on this graphic are the greatest fraction of energy in water and that is at the point of use. The water that's in, or the energy that's embedded in as heat in water is what we have the most ability to impact and this shows us that it's a pretty good target. So then on the supply side uh, we are faced with the over withdrawal of sources not just surface water that's shown here in, in Lake Mead but also groundwater. Um, quite a bit of our water supplies for drinking comes from groundwater in the U.S. and the majority of our aquifers are over withdrawn. We also have connections between our surface water and our groundwater so that if we're over withdrawing aquifers quite often it, it will affect an adjacent river as well. Um, uh, wherever we affect the quality of our water, wherever water is polluted or affected by some kind of contaminants, we make it unavailable to us to use. We also have issues related to water rights and this is most typically an eastern states and a western states issue. Well, we have locations in the U.S. such as along the Colorado River where the schema of rights were established in 1922 and it's known now that the amount of flow that these agreements were based on was a particularly high time in history. Uh, now we're running into the possibility of all of the water rights on the Colorado River not being able to be filled and yet population is growing in that region. We also have to be concerned about the cost of water and sometimes we have to be concerned because the cost of water is too low. Installation water managers that are trying to get approval of water conservation projects cannot show a good enough payback in order to finance those projects. However, when we talk about water costs, we're really looking at three different things. The cost, the pricing, and the value. Now the cost of water is what it actually costs us to operate the plants, to pump the water to its source, to clean it. The pricing is what we're able to charge our customers. And oftentimes on Army installations, that's below the cost price. But the value of water is what is it going to cost us when we don't have it? When we don't have it in the area and we have to ship it in. So that's a, a real concern that installations are paying more attention to now. And then the last bullet here talks about climate change projections and these affect water on both the supply and demand side and I have a couple more charts to show that. So to dive into the cost a little bit more, um, one thing that we know for sure is the price of water does not reflect its scarcity. And the graphic you see on the top, that circle of blues water pricing survey, this is very recent, it just came out. And what you'll note is that the cost of water in Indianapolis, the bottom line, the 57.32, is far higher than the cost in Fresno, California, whereas water is scarce in Fresno and not so much in Indianapolis. 
Um, so the people in Fresno do not have the incentive to save necessarily. I show here the average price of, of water at $4.18 a kilogallon. And the cost of water is increasing at approximately double the consumer price index. So outside the fence line, costs are going up because utilities are trying to capture that full cost of producing water. Um, where installations are moving to privatization, the chances are they're going to pay more for their water. The other thing that we're seeing an increased use of is block structures of rates. And this is similar to what we've had in the electrical utility industry for quite some time. And I was kind of surprised when I started working on water. Uh, quite often in energy utilities, the installations I was at, we would get beneficial rates because we were a large customer. I've not run across an installation yet that gets a beneficial rate for water because they're a large customer. We have the same rate as everyone else. And the other thing to know about water is depicted in the chart on the bottom right corner, the blue and gold chart. And what this shows is a multiple array of sources of water and the corresponding cost. And this happens to be at El Paso Water Utilities. Their cheapest source of water is groundwater, so that's what they'll go to first. But when they have depleted aquifers or their wells start salting up, then they go to the surface water, cost them a little bit more. And then when water rights kicks in, when the Rio Grande is suffering from the effects of a drought and they don't, they're not able to fill all their allocations, then they go to the desal plant. And that costs a lot more because it's a pretty intensive source. The next source is reclaimed, and that's partially that's treated sewage water, and then importing from outside of the region, which incurs very high pumping costs. So what you'll see is the rates will vary in that region based on what source is used. So I mentioned climate change earlier. If any of you have seen the most recent national climate assessment, which is, I think, less than a month old at this point, these are a couple graphs that came out of there. And on the top right, what we see is where regions are water stressed. And here we see primarily in the western US. And again, the definition of stress is shown where demand exceeds 40% of the supply. And then on the bottom left, it, there is a projection of changes in water withdrawals. And on the left, without considering impacts of climate change, and on the right, with considering impacts of climate change. Um, so some of the impacts of climate change as they affect water, well, first off, as temperature increases, outside temperature increases, evapotranspiration increases. So that will affect open water bodies, like lakes and river. There'll be less water in those bodies and more in the air. It'll also uh, de de decrease comfort, human comfort, or increase discomfort, requiring more comfort cooling, requiring more electricity, requiring more cooling, thermoelectric cooling of electrical plants. Um, so we see some of the demand effects and we see some of the supply effects of the climate change projections on the water cycle. And one of the tools that we developed here at Searle, and I just wanted to show one of the outputs of it, is the CIRA tool that Justine mentioned in her introduction. And it has, CIRA itself has 52 different data layers, but a number of years ago uh, there was some interest at headquarters of looking at just the watershed indicators. So what we did was we took these national map of indicators, and this is an example of one indicator labeled groundwater depletion. Um, I think it's probably USGS data, and it's available on the watershed level. So we mapped it by watershed, and then we overlaid the Army installations, and I think this is 308 installations we used at the time. And we mapped it in a five, five different indicators, the red, orange, and yellow being the less healthy indicators. And then what we did was we rolled up all of the indicators. We had a number of supply indicators and demand indicators. And the top left graph you see on this slide is what we call the in index of watershed health. And so the red areas are the worst and the green are the best. And it doesn't mean necessarily there is a threat in that region. What it means is one is advised to dive into the data and see and get maybe more local data that can support a more detailed analysis. But what we showed at the time were that 24% of our Army installations were in watersheds vulnerable to issues of health. Um, and 98 were highly vulnerable. On the bottom right, I thought this was interesting. This was from a report about a year or two ago. And it kind of validated the geographic uh, tendencies that we're seeing in water vulnerability assessments. But this was done at Colorado University. 
Okay, so I showed that slide in December to Mr. Kidd, and he said, okay, 24% of installations. But how many people? So what we did is we took the data, the population on the installation, and we analyzed that, and, the, and you see the results of it right here. So the size of these dots represents the population of the installations. And this 31% is only the red installation. So 31% of the population of installations is located in these red regions, the ones of most high, high vulnerability to issues of watershed health. Um, now, the purpose of this slide here is not so that you can read it, but is to convey the complexity of laws and policies and even codes uh, that apply to water. And some of these are older, but there are aspects of these that are still in place. And so it is very complicated. If anybody out there is from an installation, you already know this. It's very difficult to track. And yes, the, the codes and the standards and even the policies are changing all the time. Um, but when we talk to installations, these are the top ones. These are the top policies to be concerned about. We have the potable water use reduction goals, and that's in intensity, gallons per square foot. And then we have the ILA goals, irrigation, landscape, and agriculture, and that's in absolute gallons of water. And then our favorite standards are the LEED standard, ASHRAE, and the more recently updated SDD policy. So on to Fort Leonard Wood. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, water emerged as an issue of concern after a couple years of ISSP planning. That's the Integrated Strategic Sustainability Planning. There's been a long-term relationship between some folks at URTIC and the Fort Leonard Wood uh, PAIO office as the lead. And a couple years ago, they mentioned water as an issue of concern. It had floated to the top of the list, and they asked us to become involved. Uh, we started out with a water day at Fort Leonard Wood where people from DNR and people from CERL and people from other organizations came in and talked about water and then there was a little brainstorming charrette and it prioritized the work that they wanted to proceed. Uh, so here's some of the things that we talked about and emerged from that water day at Fort Leonard Wood. So our first step was to, without gathering any detailed data, to develop an initial characterization for their water use baseline. Okay, so the first stop always is AWERS, Army Energy and Water Reporting System. And this is what their data look like at that point. And we see the annual water use in water intensity. Remember the gallons per square foot is what the goal is. And then the red line represents the Army target. So we already see we're heading in the wrong direction. But we all know, we know this, don't we, that square feet do not use water. People use water, processes use water, vehicle wash racks use water. So let's see if we can find another way to understand this data. So our next step was, well, let's look at people. Maybe they had some population surges and their water went up as a result of that. Well, now we have kilogallons per capita shown on the blue line, and we see that's also rising up. So they're using more water, and each person is using more water um, as the population is dropping. So that didn't really make sense. But we're engineers. We can get more data. So our next stop was, let's compare it. Let's look at the wastewater treatment as well as the potable water provision, and let's compare it to weather data. So what we see, the blue line represents the water produced at the plant, and the red line represents the metered effluent. And we can see gaps in both directions. And now the bars across the bottom of this one are showing us um, the temperature. So we can see the seasonal swings in temperature, but we can also see, especially if you look at the far right of this graph, we can see there's a lot of water use when it's really hot. And this could be a number of things. I mean, it could be, um, well, well, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go on as we, as we discuss this. What we think a lot of it was from is perhaps was irrigation. And we go on to the next slide, we looked at another piece of weather data. We looked at rainfall. Um, and so you see the same gap in the potable water and the effluent but you see the rainfall is really low. So what happened that year? We had a drought. So probably irrigation was the main user of water. Um, and also if the temperatures were elevated at that time, perhaps evapotranspiration was a lot higher. Maybe it took more water to do some outdoor activities like the vehicle wash rack. The other thing we see, and it's called out in this graph, is we see problems with infiltration into the sewage system. 
And at the point where I've highlighted the sewage system I and I, you can see down below with those blue bars, a major rain event. So when it rains a lot, the water goes into the sewage system. So another part of our analysis, we have partners down in, um, in the Vicksburg sister lab of Erdict, and they did some hydrologic studies. And so what they were looking for, part of the net zero water program, is looking at the amount of water staying balanced on a watershed. Do you take more water out of the watershed than what you put in? And so our hydrologist looked at the amount of rain that falls within the, the drainage boundary of the Big Piney River compared to how much water the post was withdrawing out of the river. And there was also a report created for that. And the good news is that there's a lot more water in the river than Fort Leonard Wood is using on post. So the next step, it was about six months after the water day, we went on site to collect more data. And this was our site assessment team. It was a multidisciplinary team, engineers, planners, architects, and we spent a week on site. And I'm going to describe what we did while we were there. It was great fun. It was a great field activity. So one of the major activities that took place was building surveys. And it was a wide range of buildings. There were teams, there were three teams of two individuals each. And what you see is a map of the facilities. And on the left, you see one of the team members using a, a new uh, POM device with an app to collect water survey data. And right now, we're working on some software modifications so that that data can be used to calculate water savings potential. And that's going to be, that's going to be pretty handy once it's released. We also looked at the operations. We also conducted a lot of interviews and took a lot of photos. So here's a close-up of the Michael Wet tablet with the app. And this is, uh, you can see where we've got new and existing facilities types. So we've got it populated with some types of buildings and with some types of uh, rooms within buildings. But then you can create a new one if you want. You can have a template for a certain kind of room and repeat it over and over. Um, the other thing was installing flow sensors on our meters. Um, we also recorded, and on the right you see that, I'll have some close-ups. We also recorded water temperature because, remember, we're talking about integrating water and energy. So we want to know if we're heating water to the right temperature. So this is some of the examples of the building walkthroughs that took place. Oh, and I should say, when people walk through buildings, a really important thing that you can't find out just from walking through a building is the use schedule. So the other thing they had to do in each building was to find somebody who was in charge, a first sergeant or somebody who could say, how is this building used? Um, if we have any, any military folks online, you know that the barracks for basic training are used differently than advanced individual training. And we, I have an example of some data that's going to show you just exactly what that looks like. But what we did was tested each device, actually measured the amount of water flowing, used a timer to time how long it took to flush a toilet, and found what the ratings were. Because um, how often does it happen where you submit a project saying, I'm going to save this much water, I'm going to save this much en energy, based on a set of assumptions, and the assumptions were right. So we were collecting actual data. The other thing we did is we looked at irrigation systems. And I'm not going to go into this. There was a separate webinar that was given by one of the team members on the 10th of February. So if that's archived somewhere, you can take a look at it, all the details. Uh, there were four separate irrigation systems. And on the left, you see a screen capture from the automated system, which sounds like a really good idea. And it is a good idea. However, the infrastructure was leaky. So they were controlling the system in terms of how much water was going into it. Uh, but since a lot of the water was leaking out, it was not very effective. It wasn't a systemic uh, cure. And on the right, we see the RCI housing where um, I, don't, I don't think they had timers there, but one of the issues was that they were not watering the grass so much as they were watering the sidewalk. So there's a lot of issues that you don't know about unless you go on site and you take a look. This also happened to be about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, which is not an opportune time to water uh, during the hottest part of the year. So I mentioned earlier the flow recorders. Uh, and this shows a listing of the buildings we put them in. 
Right now we have seven flow recorders on site. Um, flow recorders require a water meter to be present already. And if you don't have a meter there, and there were not a lot of identified meters at the time we went to Fort Leonard Wood, but if you don't have a meter in the building, you can't use these flow recorders. So we set it at a, I think it was a 30 second interval. Each 30 seconds, the flow of the water through that meter would be recorded. And we downloaded just loads and loads and loads and loads of data and then graphed it out. And I'll show you an example of that too. So we have seven of these on site now. Our goal was to record a year's worth of data so we would get some of the seasonal changes. And you can see too, we have an array of different building types. We also tried to find buildings that were unrenovated as well as renovated, which proved challenging. As, as I mentioned earlier, there are not a lot of meters out there. The good, the good piece of this is that through our work there, the installations become very motivated at identifying all their meters, and not just the water meters, but the energy meters too. So they've identified a lot more buildings that have meters, including a whole list of LEED certified buildings. And just as an aside, because of this issue with, I mean, the flow recorders are fine. They're kind of expensive, so we're limited in how many we can buy. Um, I've got another project, uh, ESTCP Demval, and in that, I'm going to be looking at clamp-on ultrasonic meters. We're going to test, test them out and see. I've, I've heard some information that they're a lot more, a lot more accurate than the time transit, the older versions, or the Doppler versions. So we're going to test them out, and if they do work, they will be offer a new opportunity for buildings and installations that don't have a lot of meters present. So let me show you a close-up of what these flow recorders look like. So what you see here on the left, that blue thing, that's the flow recorder itself. And just kind of a word to the wise, if you decide to do something like this, you can see we zip-tied it to a secure location off the ground so it wouldn't get wet even though it's supposed to be waterproof. And you can see there's a laminated piece of paper on it. And there's instructions on that. It says who we are. It gives a local installation point of contact in case somebody goes into this utility room and wants to know why it's there. The other thing you see is you see where the hands are holding. That's a Velcro strap, and there's a sensor on the end of that strap. And that sensor has to be located on the side of the meter. And then on the bottom right, you see a laptop computer, and that's how we download the data. And with a 30-second recording interval, Every 90 days, we have to go to Fort Leonard Wood and record the data. So we've got, we're almost at the end of June, which is when we went down last year. So we're almost at a year's worth of data at many of these buildings. Um, the other thing we found out is that some of the meters are in such a heavy housing that that sensor doesn't work. So we've just ordered some new sensors, some different types of sensors. And we're going to test those out. I think the hospital was one of the sites we were not able to collect any data. And of course, we put, we put the sensor in place. And I think it was a month later we discovered it did not work. OK, so I promised data. Everybody loves a good chart. And so this is one of the AIT barracks. And this is not our original graph. We, we collected a couple sets of data. But we can see some trends. Each colored line represents a different day of the week. And these numbers across the bottom, that's the 24-hour clock, basically. When we, first, when we first showed this data, we first represented on a graph, we went, wait a minute, this water use is way too low. Nobody's using 13 gallons a day unless they're deployed. Um, and what it ended up, the, the data made us look a little bit closer. The barracks were not occupied full time over a month. And we were calculating monthly averages. So what this shows is some hourly averages. And the difference this made in our model also, showing the time of day, again, thinking about the integrated analysis. We don't really care that much how much water we're using. Particularly, we have a site that has a ready supply of water, plenty of water to go around. But time of use could influence the cost of the energy, especially when we're looking at showers, because that's hot water. It's got to be heated. And also, when we get to the point where we're trying to match source of water to supply, we want to make sure that they match in terms of that 24-hour clock. So this is our best guesstimate of what's happening on those days. Uh, and we saw some in other buildings. I'm only showing one as an example, but we saw some interesting trends of water use over time. Now this next one, because of the problem that I mentioned, we thought the water use looked really low. 
Then we plotted the data in this box and whisker graph. And what it shows is the range of data. The box represents the low value and the high value. So you can see, particularly when you get to shower time, some nights there's a lot of showers taken, other nights not so many. And then the bar in the center of that box, that's the median of data. And so this was particularly useful for us to understand the data during these times of intermittent occupancy, which was really true of the barracks. We would have one group come in to train for six weeks, say, and then the barracks would be empty for a week or two, and then another group would come in. And our data with analysis methods were not set up for that. So what I think is the most important part of any site visit is talking to the people. And you really never know what you're going to learn, but you know you're going to learn something. And so this is a list of all the different people that we interviewed, and, and a lot of it resulted in getting additional data, specifications, um, information, SOPs that were very useful for us. Um, uh, you can go and look at a swimming pool, but unless someone tells you, oh, this is what it takes to back flush the filter, oh, and we have this leak over here that loses so much water a month, um, you can't find that out without talking to a person. So the next part of the talk, I'm going to talk about what we're calling NZI, Net Zero Installation. And this is the rdt &E project. It's a research project here at Searle called Modeling for Integrated Energy, Water, and Waste. And Fort Leonard Wood is one of our demonstration sites for this project. And there, so there's some nomenclature we use um, in NZI analysis. So I'm going to go over that now. We talk about the baseline. Remember I showed some graphs earlier of the baseline. And that's the existing water. In this case, water use. For NZI, we also look at waste and energy. But our baseline is the existing water use, where it's going now. And then our base case is, if we don't change anything, if we stay the BAU, business as usual, we project in 25 years what the water use is going to look like. And that includes any kind of planned construction or demolition, or any changes. Um, and then we go through and we, can, we uh, develop some scenarios. Uh, we come up with maybe some conservation measures. Uh, we come up with maybe some major projects, maybe some water reuse, maybe upgrading a, a sewage treatment plant so we can reuse some of the water, maybe rainwater. And then we compare the alternatives, both from a water perspective, and we include energy and waste, and also from a cost perspective. So this shows the net zero planning process. And I guess what I, what I wanted to convey out of this is on the far left, we talk about the user inputs. We start out with, the main input is GIS files of the base. And then using the GIS, GIS files, we break the facilities into what we have now, a set of standard facility groups. And right now we're in the process of adding facility groups that were appropriate or were not appropriate for energy, but are appropriate for water, like vehicle wash rack, like golf course. There's not a lot of energy involved there, but there is a lot of water. And then we have something that's called the params file, short for parameters. And we have a standard default params files. And that talks about everything from how many times the average uh, admin building occupant flushes the toilet to the efficiency of a cooling tower using condensate recovery. Um, these are all things that there is a default file. But you see on the right of that wiring diagram options. So the user can select options. And then we run a simulation. And then the post-processing is making some decisions. And this is just this is to represent the linkages of the energy, water, and waste. This is an early version of our integrated model. And you can see some of these boxes represent some of the data, control schedules, um, hydrologic model. And then we can see the connections between the energy and the waste and the water modules. And this is what we're working on now. The net zero model started out as an energy model. And right now, we're working on incorporating the water and the waste. So I mentioned the baseline, how we had determined the first baseline for Fort Leonard Wood was with the AWERS data. Um, and now, uh, this, is, this is telling you how we're going to do it with the net zero planner tool. Um, I say facility population air area. Remember I said uh, square feet don't use water. For the most part, people use water. Um, we were kind of at a disadvantage here. For energy, they started out with, there's a plethora of energy models out there. And this tool happens to be using Energy Plus. 
So Energy Plus, you can pull up a standard, what has become the standard for, say, an AIT barracks, then you can estimate the amount of energy used. And a lot of it is building specific. It's got to do with the equipment in the building and the insulation and, and the weather, the weather file, 30-year weather data. Um, you can't really do that for water. Those kind of mo water models don't exist. But what we are starting out with assumptions is the amount of square foot per person. Because for the most part, people use water. But the amount of people assigned to a building will depend on the square footage. And again, it's a default value. It's in the, ma the basic PRAMS file. But it's something that we expect the user would modify immediately. We also have high water use activities. Um, I don't know if there's a corollary with energy. But this would include, for example, I mentioned the swimming pools already and vehicle wash racks. Um, and of course, irrigation is a pretty high water use activity as well. And then the water end use factors. Um, we will have a, a unit on which the water use is based. And, and again, sometimes that's population. Sometimes it will be acres in, the ter in terms of, say, irrigation. And then the last bullet that talks about water supply, eventually what we hope to do is to match the type of water supply to the end use. In particular, Fort Leonard Wood has a number of water supplies that are not potable. They have quarry ops that is using untreated water. And for that matter, the golf course is using water drawn directly from the river. So when we look at the amount of water available, we have to look at the source and match it to the supply, or match it to the demand, that is. And this is what um, our initial baseline that we modeled look like for Fort Leonard Wood. And this is using an existing tool that we have that takes into account these different units, whether it be square footage or per person or major water use. So that was the baseline. For the base case, uh, we will be projecting the demand at five-year intervals. And we will use the same sets of facilities that are being used for net zero energy and incorporate the construction and demolition that's already planned on site. And I mentioned scenarios. Uh, the way the Net Zero Planner defines scenarios is they talk about packages, and they're packages of measures. For energy, they look at the idea of making the building as efficient as you can, and then looking at the, the system. So it's, for example, you would install efficient appliances inside the building, and you would in super insulate it before you picked out the heating source. Uh, because you don't want to oversize the heater for what the building is going to be. Now, for the retrofit packages, what we have for water right now, these are specifically what we recommended for Fort Leonard Wood. More generally, for Net Zero Planner, we have a fixture package, an appliance package, and then we have two water network packages. One is the gray water, and the other is leak detection. Um, these are the ones that we made specifically for Fort Leonard Wood. And like I mentioned, you can see the tune irrigation systems. They already have um, automated irrigation systems. Um, we recommend that they check the operation of them and that they look at their sprinkler heads, that kind of thing, rather than looking at a big money investment, just tuning up what they do have. The other thing we did for Fort Leonard Wood, it was very difficult for them to keep up with, like I said, all the policies. So we've come up with a matrix that shows what all the different standards are, particularly for the fixtures, on what is recommended for the Army. On some of our retrofit projects, we've gone better than Army. We've gone more efficient than Army, and it's, and it's worked out OK. People haven't been dissatisfied. But we at least document all this, all this information. Fort Leonard Wood, in particular, said, we'd like to provide this information to our O&M contractors. We just need it in one spot. And then we had a series of recommendations. I'm just going to go over our specific recommendations from our site visit. We see here a meter that was part of it. The top right, we see a shower head that was in privatized Army lodging. This is what they're going to retrofit to. And it's, it's kind of a high use shower head. On the bottom right, it's a vehicle wash rack. It's, it's not a recycling vehicle wash rack. So maybe there's some room for savings there. And then the bottom left, we've done some work at other sites with bulk water points. It's essentially an uncontrolled point where water can be dispensed at will, and it's not monitored in any way. So maybe army-wide, there's some opportunity for savings from areas like that. 
So this is a set of our recommendations specifically for Fort Leonard Wood. I mentioned the irrigation. Um, one of the issues there with meters, and I have found this across all of the installations that I've been to, anyone who's had a problem with reimbursable customers, whenever they have installed a water meter, they found that the water use was actually higher than what they were estimating for their billing for reimbursable customers. So that's something that Fort Leonard Wood is interested in doing, is putting meters in and charging for the actual usage. And that, that's an incentive. You know, when you get a bill in the mail, it's kind of an incentive to pay attention to what you're using. We found a variety of hot water heating temperatures, and some of it has to do with the length of piping that the hot water has to travel. So they're going to take a look at that across the board. Um, and again, I mentioned the actual usage versus the metered usage for housing. That was one of the issues, uh, including the efficiency standards. The O&M folks will put in, contractors will put in whatever Fort Leonard would ask them to put in. So they want to have the right language there. The other thing, the water conservation training, we found that that was pretty easy to do at another site that had a lot of trainees, a big transient audience coming in. They included it in their environmental in-briefing. And we had a survey of soldiers at that site, and it was kind of fascinating, some of the feedback. So it's something that can be pretty short, um, but it can have an effect. Everybody who comes through there, they touch a lot of people if it's a training site. And then awareness programs. There's an ongoing project going on at Fort Riley right now. Uh, EPA is helping out under the auspices of the Net Zero Water Program on awareness, and they believe it's already having an impact on their residents. So some of the follow-on activities, we are in our second year working on water at Fort Leonard Wood, and, and I believe we'll be working into next year as well. On the right, that little diagram uh, represents a regional water balance model. And Justine mentioned earlier one of my other projects where we do water sustainability assessment, and we've looked at, so far, 19 installations where we look at the supply and demand, not just on post, because water is one of those resources that doesn't recognize the fence line. Um, when it, when it uh, flows. So we look across the region to see what the water demands are of other users in the region and what the supply looks like regionally. So that's something our partners down south in Vicksburg are doing. We're also going to recommend specific projects, building specific projects to save water, and also meter locations. In fact, this week we're having a, a brainstorming session on where meters could be loca located strategically, not just for billing purposes, but also for leak detection. We know that it's far too expensive to put meters on every building, but we think you can locate the meters strategically within the system to help you mo monitor your water usage and where it's going. We're going to continue with the flow recorders, water use data collection. So I expect our next trip down to Fort Leonard Wood will be moving some of those recorders that have already been there a year. And this data, the information that we learn is going directly into the Net Zero Planner tool. And then, again, developing the language for contracts and privatization. The other thing we're looking at, and this is near and dear to my heart, is this water cost evaluation issue. Um, there is a formula. There is an Army interim guidance on how to calculate water cost. And Fort Leonard Wood is calculating it according to the cost, but it doesn't include all of the real costs of operating and maintaining a drinking water treatment plant. So I'm going through and I'm, I'm going to capture all those presently uncounted costs and look at what the difference is and, and move that up. You know, see that somebody at higher headquarters in Army has an opportunity to see that and see if there's anything we can change Army-wide on that. Um, it, seems, it seems kind of unfair to not be able to charge for your full cost of water. And in effect, the installation is subsidizing customers. Um, and then I just wanted to list some of the other projects that we're working on. I mentioned the screening and the sustainability assessments. We also have some DEM valves here at Searle. And, and every project that we do that's in the water arena, they inform all the other projects. So things that we learn from demonstrations, they get folded into other work. Um, the Michael Wet Tools, the second from the bottom, is the one I mentioned that's going to be released soon. And the one above that, the modeling for net zero energy, water, and waste, by the end of, I believe by the end of this fiscal year, we will have an integrated online model available. And it's intended to help installations plan for integrated energy, water, and waste. Um, it's a planning level tool, so it's not a design level tool. It's not going to produce de designs, but it's going to enable what if scenario planning. If I, do, if I do this in my water system, what does it do to energy? If I do this in energy, does it have an impact on waste? 
Um, and so that's kind of exciting. We've got a couple sites that's being demonstrated at in addition to Fort Leonard Wood, and I'm kind of excited to have the whole system online. And with that, I want to thank um, our leads for ISSP at Fort Leonard Wood are Annette Stumpf and Sue Bevelheimer. And of course, I just list two people at Fort Leonard Wood. Everybody down there was just so welcoming and helpful, and we're in constant contact seeking more and better data. And also the other folks, some of whom were shown in that site visit team photo and others who are not, who have helped with this project and others. And with well, that, subject you, to your Mr. questions, that um, completes my presentation. I will open up the question and answer screen. Oh. And I will read off the, off the questions for Elizabeth so she can answer. So if you can ask your questions, put them in the little box at the bottom. I see somebody raise their hand. John asks, are the slides available for download? They are on the Mercy site, and you can watch the webinar. Are there any other questions? We have about, oh, yeah, there's a few questions coming in. Okay, Paul asks, what are the reasons for the very large diversions from toilet flushers? Did you hear For me? the very what? I'm sorry. What are the No, what Diversion are the reasons for the very something about toilet for toilet flushing? For the low ratings for toilet flushing? Low the versions? Reason. Sorry, Justine, I'm missing that. Let me. Oh, for the very large deviations from toilet flushes. Oh, boy, I wish I knew. I wasn't on these, these teams. It could be a couple of things. It could have been, Paul, it could have been an older toilet that just had a flush valve that was designed for that. Or it could have been that it was um, misfiring and that it was flushing for a longer period of time. I, I know I'm looking at that slide, 9.85 and 6.5 gallons per flush. That's pretty bad. I probably had to look up building 937 and 635 to see what they were. But we did audit some newer buildings, and we audited some older buildings because we wanted a range of values. I think. Um, Depending on if it has a piston or a diaphragm, that affects how accurately a toilet will flush over time. Um, my understanding is some of them fail before others, so perhaps that's perhaps that was the technology. And I, yeah, I don't. We don't have that data in our report. I'm sure it's in the Microwet tool. What type of valve it was? Okay. The next question. Can you hear me? <laughs> Sorry. I pushed a button. Um, mentioned there were five. Oh, you are. Oh, OK. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the question, too, on the screen. Five installations with net zero goal for water. What are they? Yeah. Five, um, five installations. We have eight net zero water installations um, that were shown on that Oops. earlier slide. Uh, see if I can recite the eight installations. Um, I'm not sure if the question is the goal or the installations. For the goals, the installations were asked to challenge themselves and to establish their own goal. My understanding is it's about double what the typical goal is, what the 2% per year, which ends up being 26%. And in fact, we had a 
a conference call earlier today with Fort Riley, and their reduction goal was 50%. But it was a goal that they were able to select themselves. They just were encouraged to make it more challenging than the regular water goal, the 26%. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what all the goals are. There are water balance studies that were done on all of the net zero water, the eight net zero water installations, and, and that documents them. Um, unfortunately, those were not released. Those were sponsored by the DASA's office, and those were not released for public um, based on requests of the installations. She wanted to know what the installations were. Oh, what the installations were? Oh, sure, sure. Okay, they're on, and they're on this graph. Once you download the slides, it's Aberdeen Proving Grounds, Fort Bliss, Fort Buchanan, Fort Carson, Joint Base Lewis McCord, Camp Rylea, Fort Riley. Toby Hanna Army Depot. And these are based on a selection process that was probably about four years ago that it took place. Installation self-nominated and some committees met and reviewed the nominations and made the selections. Yeah, it's way at the beginning where it has the photos on the outside of the of the fire hydrant being flushed and the sidewalk being watered. Sure. There you go, right there. Oops, one more. Okay, next question. Where is the net zero model available? So the net zero planning tool is online. Right now, I believe there's a public version of the Net Zero Energy Planning tool online and as we are working to integrate water and waste. It will be available online. It's, it's kind of a complicated tool. Um, Justine, you're working with this as well. Do you know, am I speaking the truth on that? The Net Zero Planner? Well, that it will be available to, I mean, the Net Zero Energy tool, the, the first version of it was released already, um, maybe April or so, uh, of the Net Zero Energy tool. As far as getting access to it, I'm not sure if you need an ID or what, or if you can just go online. But Justine, maybe that is something that I can check on. Is there a way to provide feedback sure. after the webinar is over? Sure, I can just send over? out a, an email to everybody that's invited. Um, I think that the site admin have to add people. You have to ask permission to be included in, in the site. Are there any other questions? We have about six minutes. All right. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth. I really appreciate your time, and it was a very interesting co uh, conversation and, and presentation. Thank you, everybody.